Greetings, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, hear me okay. Um, I'd like to um, uh, begin by uh, saying a few thank yous. Uh, one to uh, the Boston Review and the Philosopher for hosting this uh, event. Uh, thank you to Melvin Rogers for you know, writing a book that I hope all of you will kind of read, teach, and debate for some time to come. This extraordinary work uh, that we'll be um, conversing about uh, today. And also, um, uh, you know, thanks for uh, kind of reasoning kind of with us, uh, because it won't just be the conversation, but also your input. And so, um, and so, uh, Melvin, uh, I wanted to, um, you know, begin by way of uh, introduction, uh, insofar as um, thinking about different ways of discussing modern Black uh, political thought and then trying to situate what I take your book uh, to be uh, doing, if that's, uh, if that's okay, if you'll indulge me. Um, uh, there are different ways uh, of thinking about uh, not only uh, African-American political thought, but what we may call, or many of us in the field called um, Africana thought. And by Africana thought, we can understand that as, uh, as a particularly modern mode of thinking uh, beginning uh, October 12th, uh, 1492, as Sylvia Winter and Enrique Dussel and others have said, uh, and in the wake of that, in the Atlantic slave trade and the kind of the formation of those who subsequently uh, either identified as or have been identified uh, themselves by as either African uh, or of African descent. Uh, and when thinking about Africana thought in the modern period, there are seem to be perhaps three key questions. Uh, the first question uh, we might call the identity question, the third, uh, the freedom question, and the second kind of mediating those two, uh, the equality question. And so what do I mean? And then how does this relate to your book? The identity question can be posed very uh, uh, directly and shortly. Who am I and who are we, right? Who am I and who are we? The second question, the equality question, oftentimes uh, we might be using that term, but not in the same way. So there are different, what one may call kind of vertical ideas of equality, basically kind of hierarchical and horizontal ideas of equality. And so in vertical ideas of equality, one thinks of kind of separate but equal doctrines in which with regards to questions of race, uh, where those who've been racialized as white and a certain part of a hierarchy and those racialized as black in a different part of the hierarchy. Within different groups, there might be the same access to resources and provisions, but those two groups don't experience the world in the same way. And it seems that part of the challenge is trying to create, uh, to shift from a vertically equal world to a horizontally and egalitarian world. And then the last, the freedom question, put directly, what does it mean to be free? Uh, how does freedom relate to conditions of enslavement and uh, are liberation and emancipation the same as uh, as as freedom uh, and the like? But what your book does that I admittedly um, have not, and many others have not, and you're really pushing us in this book, is to actually talk about another idea, which is democracy. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but which is the kind of the question of uh, democracy. And so this goes directly then to how I'm hoping we could begin the conversation, which is that you open the darkened light of faith with the following question, and I quote, what is it about democracy that justifies our faith, especially African-Americans' faith in it, end quote. And then, Melvin, you go on to state that your book is an attempt at answering this uh, question. So I'm hoping to kind of get us started. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you could explain to us why you sought to provide uh, though in book form, an in-depth answer to this uh, question, instead of, for instance, framing a detailed work in uh, African-American political thought through an alternative framework. So really, why why democracy? Yes, there is um, questions of race and freedom in the subtitle, but the book is, from beginning and then through the end, trying to actually center uh, the question of uh, 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 the, the meaning and practice of democracy and related ideals. So, um, so kind of, um, how did you go about uh, framing this particular project in that um, in that way. 
Well, thank you, um, uh, Neil, for the question. Uh, thanks um, to the philosopher, to the Boston Review, and of course, to all of you. Um, we have a very nice turnout, so I appreciate you very much um, uh, uh, for uh, joining the conversation um, and um, helping me to celebrate um, this book of sorts, right? Um, so let me, um, the, the question that sort of animates the book is this question about sort of what justifies faith and democracy, especially that of African-Americans. I think before really uh, we can get to this question, I have to sort of stand back a little bit and just sort of say a word about um, uh, my orientation to the figures that comprise the book. The book roughly runs from the 1830s with the abolitionist uh, David Walker, and it sort of concludes uh, in the 1960s and 70s with uh, James Baldwin, and there's a whole series of figures uh, in, in, in between. But I see, you know, I sort of see these figures uh, in the first instance as uh, public philosophers. And I use the language of uh, of public philosophers here. I don't use it in the book, although uh, I, I now regret not using it in the book, but I use it here mm -hmm. because I think that there's a tendency in reading these figures and in reading African-American political thought and seeing these figures as, um, uh, as activists, yeah. as organizers, um, as strategists engaged in all kinds of political machinations in order to secure their freedom and, uh, mm -hmm. and equality. Um, and it seems to me that all of that is true, but it really obscures that these thinkers were attempting to offer uh, rich arguments yeah. for why it is that their white counterparts and their black counterparts Ought, ought to follow them yes. in their way of thinking about democracy, their angle on democracy, and the principles that they thought um, uh, ought to guide ought to guide democratic uh, democratic practice. And and this way of seeing them then means that they had very rich ideas about the kinds of human beings we must be so that we can be. Uh, properly responsive to the greed events of our fellows. They had rich and complicated ideas about what freedom and equality amounted to. Um, and they had those rich ideas amid, and I think this is very important, amid the sort of persistent attacks on them and that class of persons, uh, African-Americans, that class of persons to which, uh, to which they belonged. And uh, as they looked around, um, it wasn't clear um, that there was evidentiary resources to support the actions that they were taking, to support the appeals that they were making to both their white and black counterparts. And it was at that moment, as I was sort of reading the tradition from the yeah. 1830s to the 1960s, it was at that moment that it, that, that it, it seemed to me that the, that the sort of, that one way to get a handle on what these thinkers are thinking about uh, is to focus on this idea of faith. And the moment you do this, you'll come, you'll see, I hope you'll see by the time you arrive at the end of the book, is that the issues that they're dealing with, racial inequality, uh, racial discrimination, racial disadvantage, that's the, those are the case studies as it were, right? Um, yeah. But that the kinds of insights that they're trying to offer although they are related to these case studies as it bears on the life chances of black people, the thought is that these are resources that should inform what we take a healthy democracy, what we take a healthy democracy to be. Yeah, so um, because um, I had a, another follow-up question, but I actually want to pivot because um, uh, I want to go to where you just ended, which is that um, you not only talked about um, though you didn't you know, use the phrase in the book that, um, that this is an engagement in part with public philosophy, but in terms of the, the point about faith and why faith, you know, I noticed, you know, you didn't use, you don't use religion, right? Uh, you don't use spirit. Uh, you do talk about in the book, for those, again, who, once you get a chance to read the book, you do talk about soul and not merely with a figure like W.B. Du Bois and the Souls of Black Book, but you do talk about soul, but, um, but, but why uh, kind of 
why discuss, you know, faith as a way for us to not only understand the idea of democracy, but particularly to talk about uh, uh, the tradition of African American um, uh, political thought, and it, and you do preface the work by stating that primarily you're focusing on uh, African American thinkers within the United States, but you know, the, as 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 you noted, and uh, and and I, since I have it here, also talking about uh, the volume that you had recently published, also with uh, Jack Turner, African American political thought, uh, a collected history. The idea of American also takes into account the kind of the Americas, but specifically for this book, why faith, uh, and why do you kind of use that um, as a way for us or to push us to actually try and understand the kind of the stakes of not only democracy but also the kind of the fracturing of the demos uh, that in race, modern racial states has continually been uh, a challenge to try and um, address. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I mean, it's partly because, you know, African-American political thought comes on the scene and in response um, to a sustained attack uh, on the dignity of Black people and the denial um, of dignity to Black people. And so African-American political thought emerges as a response to that. Um, and at least here focusing on the United States, uh, as one looks around, and here I mean it from the perspective of uh, David Walker, of Mariah Stewart, of Hosea Easton, the figures that populate the book, as one looks around from their perspective, it isn't clear that there are um, material resources, uh, evidence to support that the United States can be something other than uh, a slaveholding society um, hell-bent on dominating Black people. That's the sort of drama of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, well, if, if, that's, if that's the landscape as they're describing it, how then do we make sense of their affirmative gestures, right, mm -hmm. toward their white counterparts? How do we make sense of their affirmative engagement with the polity? And as I was sort of reaching for a term that could help sort of stabilize the narrative from the 1830s to the 1960s, faith presented itself as an option where faith here means uh, running ahead of the evidence that you need to justify the stance that you're taking. Yeah. Uh, running ahead of the evidence that you need to justify the stance, or in this case, the appeal that these folks are, are making. And what, you, and what you come to discover, what I came to discover as I was reading these figures is, is that they also wanted us to see that under, under these kinds of conditions of oppression, where uh, the backs of, of human beings are against the wall, and it is not clear that the polity to which you belong is susceptible to transformation, what they want to contend is that the is that what you often find yourself standing on uh, is faith. Now it will be now maybe it's a sort of a faith story in human nature. Maybe it's a faith story in the kind of what I argue in this book, the kind of aspirational core of of democracy. But a faith claim, but a faith claim all all, all the same. That uh, part of what I try to argue seems to, seems for them seems to be sort of wedded to uh, democratic struggle, particularly under uh, uh, dramatic and intense oppressive conditions. Yeah, and so speaking of the the them, I was hoping you could um, in a moment say more with regards to who are some of the, you know, a snapshot of some of the figures who really animate the narrative that you're, uh, that you're telling. But I, I, I wanna invite you to do so with regards to what I take to be perhaps one of the, the kind of the biggest contributions of the book, which is your intervention into how we understand republicanism, small r, <laughs> not Republican part, but republicanism, small, uh, you know, kind of small r. And so that republicanism, small r, is a central tradition in the history of, uh, of philosophy and political theory. It's also over, uh, taught uh, overwhelmingly in a deraced manner. Right? Uh, and the implications of this squarely are that it's a tradition that's been taught uh, incompletely. And so one of the, you know, what I'd written in the kind of advanced blurb to your book is that you exhibit what I, I call kind of Copernican gusto, like kind of Copernicus. That is a boldness of the argument in the dark and light of faith 
which, uh, and unless I'm reading this wrong, is meant to shatter forever um, previous views that we may have held dear or irrefutable. And you suggest not only that another vision of the world is possible, perhaps that's the faith part that you're inviting us to consider, but that this vision was in part previously articulated, yet whether silenced or disavowed or simply uh, underappreciated. So, uh, so what I want to ask you to kind of help explain to us is what exactly is republicanism to you, small r, and how have you sought with this kind of Copernican gusto to rewrite republicanism's genealogy through close attention to 19th uh, and uh, and 20th century uh, black intellectuals, artists, and movement and the movements that they ushered in. And, and, and really you do address kind of artists and movements, but in a way that you open with, which is also to, to understand these as uh, contributing to thought, but really republicanism, a, a tradition that really is thought to, at least in Western political thought to be irrelevant in the 19th century. And then you're saying not only was it relevant, but it was really uh, black women, men, children, uh, figures known, uh, less well-known, perhaps unknown that, um, that actually um, kept the faith. Mm-hmm. in a particular type of way in the face of um, what might have seemed irrational, right? Right. Well, look, let, let me first say that I think um, you were quite generous in your blurb there. Um, and I, pre- I appreciate the, um, uh, I appreciate the drama of, uh, of, of, of that blurb. Um, so thank you for that. I, the story of Republicanism uh, appears uh, very early in the book. So, if part of if part of the preoccupation with the book is about sort of what justifies African Americans' faith in democracy, there's a, a question um, about sort of how are they thinking about the people to whom they're appealing? And uh, what I argue in the book is that it opens up a distinction. Uh, it's not unique to African Americans. It's housed within democratic theory. Um, and it's housed within democratic practice, ordinary democratic practice, um, in which there's a distinction between the, between the people that enjoy rights and privileges per a constitution, and then sometimes the ways in which we sort of rhetorically invoke the people as a way to redirect the energies of um, of the demos of our constituencies, right, of a country. And that second idea of the people is aspirational. And part of what I argue is that African-American thinkers lean heavily on this second aspirational dimension. And then this raises a series of questions about, well, how do you get the people on the ground to embrace this new vision of themselves? And that sort of motivates my argument, arguments in the book around rhetoric, around aesthetics, and around uh, the emotions. But one of the central uh, principles or ideas that's guiding all of this is the idea of freedom, which mm-hmm. I derive from African Americans uh, um, uh, in the 19th century, their early use of the tradition of republicanism. And so, so, so what is republicanism? Well, it, I mean, it seems to me that in, uh, in its sort of con- in contemporary discourse, republicanism refers to two, uh, uh, two different strands of political theorizing, one um, that relates to sort of um, uh, um, sort of uh, the kind of the sort of the sort of Greek uh, tradition, uh, and the other one that refers to the Roman tradition. Uh, the first of these emphasizes the importance of, uh, of character and habits that are necessary to sustain a political society. And so it places a great deal of emphasis on virtues. But the, mm-hmm. but the but the question uh, it, but the question becomes well why is this this important well it's important to give direction to your political uh, community and presumably it's important to guard against various forms of corruption uh, and various forms of exploitation here enters I think the sort of second strand which is largely derived from the Roman tradition although we also see it among the Greeks which places uh, uh, an emphasis on um, the absence of domination. Uh, you don't want to be at the arbitrary mercy of, uh, of your fellows. And thus you need institutional forms that will embody this idea of freedom that's trying to guard against domination. But now, now this tradition of republicanism in its sort of contemporary 
uh, its contemporary valence is associated with figures like Quentin Skinner and Philip Pettit. And in fact, um, and in fact, both of them, I think it's 1997, Pettit uh, publishes Republicanism yeah. and, and Skinner publishes his little book, Liberalism uh, uh, Before Liberty. Um, and one of the things that emerges in both of these books is this sense that really what freedom of, what freedom is about is about a status, right? the status that you enjoy. And part of what I try to sort of argue in the early part of my book is that this discussion about status was understood to refer to those who have or don't have uh, political standing per institutional recognition. Your institutions need to recognize you as having status. And so the thought, we see it very clearly in the American case as they took themselves to be experiencing um, domination at the hands of the British crown, the aim was to break from the British crown and to establish institutional forms that could embody a form of freedom that guarded against domination. What I try to suggest is that for these thinkers, African-Americans, as they deal with the problems of um, uh, racism, that the sort of challenge, the challenge to their standing is not fundamentally in the first instance about their legal standing. In the first instance, it's about their very humanity. And so that part of what the Republican tradition missed as I am describing it, is that the repair to this standing of Black people mm -hmm. can simply be captured by proper, by proper laws. That in fact, it requires one to sort of chan chan challenge the ideas about Black inferiority that are in circulation. So that the issue of status for these African-American thinkers stands behind the institutional forms and is related to the sort of cultural and sort of symbolic fuel, field in which in which black people stand. And so that part of what they say is that, look, we need to focus on the culture of American life and the ways in which that culture habituates white Americans to disregard African-Americans as in the first instance, humans. And therefore, because it can deny them their status as humans, it then can deny their legal standing. And so African-Americans spend a lot of time uh, focusing on how white Americans both see themselves, their own humanity, and how they see African Americans uh, and their and their humanity, and they try to sort of bring this domain of culture uh, uh, clearly in view as the first site of engagement. Yeah, yeah. So, kind of sticking with this, I'm hoping that you could say more with regards to even maybe a couple of the the figures who you uh, examine with regards to what you just said. So, thinking particularly with re um, uh, with regards to the 19th century. Uh, either um, David Walker or Maria Stewart, and elsewhere, we've we've discussed uh, this idea that even in kind of um, um, modern kind of Africana thought, uh, there are figures who, over the last several decades, may have even been kind of written about, but often um, taught. You know, are, are are some of these figures actually taught in our classes regularly? Often, uh, unfortunately, not. And so it seems that um, uh, Maria Stewart, David Walker were trying to address. Uh, what you uh, have just described, but also into the, into the 20th century, not so much in merely the kind of the rhetorical form uh, or the kind of written form, but also in terms of aesthetics, the kind of the realm of kind of singing. You have a chapter where you in, you talk about uh, not only um, Ida B. Wells, but particularly Billie Holiday. Uh, and especially if, if, if I recollect Holiday's rendition of the song Strange Fruit, particularly in the chapter in your book, dealing with kind of lynching. Um, and in this, uh, in your, I think, kind of um, attempt to give an archeology span of uh, a kind of a, a disavowed or, uh, and also kind of uh, un underappreciated account of Republicanism in African-American thought, there is still nonetheless the stark reality of these kind of um, kind of peaks and troughs of a uh, black folk being in uh, a republic, trying to, as Du Bois articulated in, in 1935 in Black Reconstruction in America, trying to uh, re, uh, render lost cause narratives and actually talk about the reality of, uh, of, of things on the ground. 
why must one keep faith in these different junctures in which there is an affront to try and actually have that kind of racially just society, that equal society, that free society, that democratic society. And yet there are still these attempts in this tradition that you're you're showing in these differing forms from Walker's appeal to Holiday's song that are not abandoning the aspirational, you were calling it the kind of this aspirational ideal, but but is but make no mistake, is not romanticizing right. um, uh, racial kind of racial violence, um, interracial, what Daniel Allen calls interracial distrust, and uh, and the like. Does it make sense? In other words, I, I hear what you're saying about republicanism, but but besides just the kind of philosophical theoretical tradition, why try to articulate and situate the activities and actions and thought of 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 kind of modern black folk when there perhaps are those who are saying maybe it's not liberalism. Maybe it's uh, not cons- uh, a genre of conservatism, but is it really republic? Is it a version of republicanism? I think you're right, but uh, if you could say something to those who might say uh, they don't doubt what you have uh, charted, but maybe it's something um, that uh, is d- you know, distinct, let's say, from even uh, republicanism that right continues prior to your works like yours that. Um, that don't actually account uh, for kind of Afro-modern actors. So what do you say to that? Right. I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things that I try to say in the book, because um, the important thing when you sort of read uh, these uh, thinkers, and I don't think it's just unique to the African-American thinkers. I think I could actually make this a, this case broader with respect to the thinkers uh, in this period of the United States more more broadly. But when you read them, they're often philosophizing and theorizing on the go. They're usually in the middle of things, right? Things, right? There are crises um, and problems that are pressing on them at that moment and the people to which they belong requiring a response. And then they sort of reach out. They reach out for resources. So one of the things that I say in the book is that although I sort of lean on republicanism very early on to help bring into view the particular character of domination, we should not think that republicanism as a tradition that Black folks are pulling from, that it actually exhausts, it actually exhausts the resources that they're relying on. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, there is still the sort of natural rights tradition, which is derived from, uh, uh, in, in, in this case, for these thinkers, and what most people would want to would want to identify it with with the liberal tradition. But my my point uh, uh, in focusing on republicanism was to try to sort of centralize this idea of domination and try to centralize this preoccupation with culture and importantly following their language. So when David Walker speaks about uh, the republic, um, and and he um, and he and he invokes the language of republic in an effort to sort of shame his readers, because part of what he wants to to sort of highlight, well, is this a republic that enslaves human beings and sort of treats them this way? When Martin Delaney invokes republic or Douglas invokes republic, these terms are not, the the invocation of this is not ornamental. Um, Mm -hmm. It is meant to sort of tap into a very robust a robust tradition, and they're interested in deploying it in the in the service of the struggles that African Americans uh, that African Americans find themselves in. But you are right. A part of the suggestion is that you're right. They're not sort of thinking in the first instance. Oh, well, how do I sort of you know um, how what I to stand to this constellation of thinkers? Yeah, this? yeah, that's right. <laughs> and how do I sort of work out in relation to what they're up to? This idea of freedom. Yeah. No, no, no. They're not proceeding that, and they're not proceeding that way, and that has everything to do uh, with the character of the uh, of of them as public philosophers. Yeah. So traditions, resources are simply instruments um, in trying to speak to um, uh, uh, speak to the experiences of domination and subordination that Black people find themselves uh, experiencing. And the reason why democracy as the overarching term becomes the term 
combine them all together is yeah. because yeah. democracy functions as that term that is at once preoccupied with freedom and more mm -hmm. significantly believes that that freedom is secured by virtue of people who um, are seen as equal, having a hand in shaping the shared world uh, to which one belongs. And this above all else is what these thinkers were trying to contribute to and trying to get us to understand that in that contribution is also found yeah. not only possibilities, but more significantly our fragility. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, what was striking and actually reading your book, which then led me to <laughs> go back to the works of uh, figures that I either hadn't necessarily um, reasoned with in a long time. And so one of the things that struck me was um, David Walker and David Walker's appeal in the different chapters, the discussion of kind of wretchedness, right? He talks about kind of the wretched, even in the titles of wretchedness. And then speaking of our contemporary geopolitics, um, the work of a figure, as you know, that I've kind of tried, spent some time quite some time thinking with a figure like Franz Fanon. You know, we know the kind of translation of his last um, work while he was alive, uh, you know, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, but the Dame de la Terre, right? The kind of the damned, the wretched. But both Walker and Fanon, like Billie Holiday and Du Bois and Ida B. Wells were those, it seems, who were trying to think about not only what does it mean to kind of exist in a kind of a, a, a wretched state, um, but... Uh, back to your faith idea, right? that at that moment, or what Dante calls like, like in the kind of inferno, kind of the circles of hell, right? That the kind of the moment in which one finds himself almost in the circles of hell, how does one kind of get out of this um, condition? Are you just kind of locked or like a movie like Get Out? Are you just simply locked, right? Like the teacup, you know, locked in a kind of state of non-being and frozen. Um, that all that these different thinkers, these artists, these intellectuals who might not have been, as you're saying, thinking about, well, how can my actions be fit into some existing or intellectual tradition? We're nonetheless thinking about resistance. The, how does one become free when one is unfree? And then ultimately the nature of uh, democratic, right? The nature of democratic uh, life. Uh, and, and, and it seems like that is not the only, but one of the important contributions that you're doing is to try and um, spell out for us and to sit with right, um, their ideas, perhaps in ways in which maybe independently we might have, you know, I'd have analyzed or discussed at the dinner table. We see this in, you know, I, I believe some, there was some individuals who mentioned they were in the opening um, uh, uh, from Jamaica, the Caribbean, the different ways in which kind of Rastafari has thought about this, uh, the movement has thought about uh, uh, thought about this uh, kind of as well, right? The kind of the sense of, are we frozen? Or are we, um, is there in a, is there a way to resist domination and arbitrary interference in our lives, but in a way that is attentive to at the end of the book, for those, again, everyone to read it at the end of the book, without giving too much away, Melvin, you, um, uh, you engage with uh, uh, not merely Baldwin, but also the work of Gunnar Merdell, right? The kind of the American, the author, the Swedish author of the American Dilemma, a kind of architect of a certain genre of liberal political kind of thinking and consultation with also some of the modern philanthropic organizations. And what are the ways in which even discussions of racial justice and resistance within a certain variety of kind of liberal political thinking um, nonetheless perhaps did not tell the whole story mm -hmm. to what um, needs perhaps to be done to think about a world outside of kind of domination, but is attentive nonetheless as Murdal was and as Baldwin, as you articulate, was as well, but in a perhaps uh, a, a deeper sense um, to questions of a term that you actually, I didn't even necessarily see it much in even your index, disregard. You know, uh, or what Toni Morrison talks about, not only the source of self-regard, what does it mean to be disregarded by virtue of one's racial standing in uh, a heron vote democracy, right? A democracy that is hierarchical um, as opposed to one in which we should all find ourselves having the same access to resources, having the same options, not merely the equality of opportunity, but also outcomes. This is perhaps the 
inconvenient truth of 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 the book, but it's also like, what you call it, what it Baldwin's gift is that was the phrasing right James Baldwin's gift. Uh, if you yeah. could say something about that. So I mean, so one of the you know um, I don't want to into this as you said a, a great many things there. Um, so so let me say a word first about an earlier point that you made about sort of the resources of this and sort of thinking about sort of geopolitical politics. I mean, my rule of thumb, um, uh, my rule of thumb is really um, that one, um, uh, you know, really should try to stick to discussing what one knows, you know, mm -hmm. what one knows, right? Um, and so uh, my the the book is largely housed within the sort of national frame. Mm -hmm. um, and it's housed within a national frame at precisely the moment where the sort of drift in um, uh, uh, thinking about um, uh, African-American figures, uh, figures more broadly in, in sort of sort of Africana philosophy, um, it, it's housed within a national frame right at a time where in black studies or political science, political theory, or certain uh, brands of uh, philosophy want to sort of think internationally. Uh, about the connections among uh, Black people in the United States and in other, and in other domains. Um, and I deliberately uh, uh, do not make that move because uh, I'm very concerned about the ways in which that move often flattens um, the very different experiences of Black people in different parts of the West. Um, mm -hmm. and attempts to sort of narrate responses that, that don't capture the sort of the sort of texture of the experiential condition in which black people are housed. So I said, so I said to myself, well, look, I'm going to stay, if you would forgive me here, I'm just going to sort of stay yeah. local and yeah. think about a collection of African American thinkers uh, in the ways in which they're sort of grappling with um, uh, um, with their exclusion and their domination. I think to your sort of your sort of the sort of last invocation of James Baldwin. I mean, one of the things that takes place in the book is that I've been defending across I don't know how many pages this story of aspirational politics that cuts across a great many figures, and one does not have to know a great deal about the United States to 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 sort of see how aspirational politics might easily articulate with or fit with. Um, mm -hmm. kinds of myths Americans are committed to, our exceptionalism, um, uh, the sense that we're sort of fated to um, progress and develop mm -hmm. in a suspicious direction. And regardless of how many times political scientists, political theorists, and historians try to sort of disabuse us of this, we nonetheless seem tied to this idea of our exceptional uh, character, regardless of how many times it's presented to us as being as being false. And so by the time I got to the end of the book, the question was, well, Melvin, how do you guard against these thinkers being co-opted for this kind of progressive story um, yeah. that is part of the myth mythos? And it seemed to me um, that as I was sort of turning to um, the 1950s uh, uh, and 60s, a number of figures presented themselves as candidates. Um, but James Baldwin stood out as the brightest light. And I'll just add a caveat here. All of these thinkers are in some sense meant to be representative figures. So the thought is, is that if one wanted to retrace the steps, there are other figures that should be able to sort of populate the categories from, from David Walker, Mariah Stewart, down to James Baldwin. But the thing that James Baldwin has seemed to me helped me to see is, is, is um, or the thing that James Baldwin insisted on is disentangling, to disentangle progress talk in the United States yeah. from yeah. redemption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where redemption for him is is about um, relieving us, absolving us of the sins that are constituted by or that are expressive of uh, uh, the various practices of of white supremacy and racial discrimination. And what Baldwin wanted to, what Baldwin insisted is, is that no, those deeds have been done. The deeds are in Ozai Royce's language, irrevocable. Yeah. And it has seeded uh, 
the political and ethical landscape we now inhabit. And it is our inheritance. And Baldwin's claim is, okay, what are you going to do in response to it? And what he wanted to insist on is that if you take seriously this claim about the sort of irrevocable deeds, if you're interested and follow him in trying to disentangle progress talk from redemption, you will begin to sort of think about the work of, of democracy insofar as it's responding to the persistence of sort of racial inequality and racial disadvantage. You begin to sort of think about that work in a different way. Um, the, the, the test of whether or not the United States is really sort of up to the task and interested in yeah. responding to the persistence of this problem will now be defined by the skills with which we deploy in trying to address these issues, not whether or not we finally yeah. overcome them, but the skills with which we are constantly responding uh, to them as, um, as these issues are always threatening to intrude on the present. Mm -hmm. and, and Baldwin wanted to say that that is the lesson of our democracy in the United States, given our specific racial history. And that then requires that in the it, sort of in the practices of, of struggle and the practices of political and legal responses, all of those can only make sense um, in light of the trauma that brought them into existence. And that there's no way to give an affirmative response to dealing with racial inequality without Baldwin insisted simultaneously keeping in view the trauma um, um, uh, and, and, you know, Baldwin uses the language and the betrayal um, yeah. that was, um, uh, um, that was uh, committed uh, in the name of the nation. Yeah. Well, looking at the time, this is maybe a good time to um, invite uh, uh, kind of collective reasoning and participation from the uh, from the audience. Maybe that's a good juncture. Okay, let's jump straight in. So there's loads of questions that have come in. I guess we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. I thought I'd start with Avery Johnson's question, as Avery appears to have read some or maybe all of your book, Melvin. So <laughs> Avery says, in, in the book, you discuss that resisting domination for Black Americans is to resist living, quote, at the arbitrary mercy or whim of their white counterparts, what Walker refers to as do classical and contemporary thinkers as the absence of Republican liberty, end quote. Um, Avery then goes on to contrast Frederick Douglass's view with David Walker's view saying Douglass believed that it is possible for black Americans to get justice in the US while Walker believed it to be nearly impossible in view of the passage of time since Walker or Douglass whose thoughts are vindicated in view of history. Uh, you know, that's a very sort of important question and, and one really would want me to sort of uh, um, uh, to offer some response, but I think in some ways that's really for others to actually that's, that's up to others to assess. Um, if you sort of follow the logic of, uh, or the argument of, of the book, part of what both Walker and Douglas wants to insist is that the practices of domination that are on display uh, in the 19th century do not fully exhaust what the tradition of American life is because they see this themselves, even as they're resisting in various forms as contributors to it. And, and so one of the things that they wanted to insist is, is that the sort, of, the sort of legitimating logic of democracy, what makes it worthy of respect and obedience is this sense of openness that we're constantly calling into view by virtue of speaking of a people not yet, a people yet to be, uh, yet to be discovered. And what that does then, it creates this sort of dynamic space of resistance uh, among, among, these, uh, among these thinkers um, and a resistance that they think is sort of internal to part of the sort of, the sort of dynamism of a democratic life. If I'm pushed to make an inference, which I don't think history sort of justifies this, if I'm pushed to make an inference, um, would, would you know would 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 Walker uh, you know uh, would Walker have eventually arrived at the place that Martin Delaney arrived in the 1850s, which is we need to get up and leave? 
Would he have arrived at the place uh, in the 1920s when Marcus Garvey, given the persistence of what was going on, right? Um, I'm not sure that he would have, because each of those moments, importantly, was marked by important resistance from African Americans and their allies, and crucial and crucial advances. Although we don't want to speak about those advances as sort of finally wiping out um, or absolving us of the of, of, of the sort of stain of of slavery and white supremacy. Can I just add one small point to this? Absolutely, please. Um, which, which is that um, I think it's a great question. I would just note that what's really striking is that both David Walker and Frederick Douglass in the antebellum period, meaning the period before the U.S. Civil War, open much of their addresses with citizens, right? <laughs> Fellow citizens, referring to other um, uh, uh, Black women, men, and children, uh, uh, Black people more broadly as, as citizens, even though they both understood that the state did not recognize these persons uh, legally as such. So something some, in some ways kind of unites their particular frameworks, however distinct that they are, with a sense in which even just the invoking, we see it in the appeal, uh, perhaps with Douglas most clearly in the meaning of Fourth of July uh, to the Negro, or, or sometimes uh, put as "What to the slave is the Fourth of July?" Right, fellow citizens, right, citizens. Uh, but each of these figures are, are ones in which there are kind of competing interpretations. So perhaps Melvin's point that uh, maybe leaving it to the reader to uh, to decide. But I think that that point is still worth um, noting. But the, I would say that the reason why they were able, just to the to the audience, the reason why they were able to constantly invoke the language of citizen, is because they did not believe that the that the sort of that the status of citizenship was in the first instance determined by legal recognition. That for them, in the first instance, it was determined by by our simple capacity to judge the environment in which we stood. And in fact, that was the same capacity that the that the American colonists appealed to as they contested the British the British crown. Yeah. Okay, so um, Davon Boyd asks. I appreciate the concept of faith as a normative anchor for theorizing racial reconciliation and democratic inclusion. Can you speak more on faith in the black tradition as an engine of political action for the thinkers you investigate? So um, Melvin, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, so so we already see in, um, uh, in uh, Frederick Douglass' famous Fourth of July uh, uh, address um, that this idea of faith uh, is motivating um, his uh, activism, and it's motivating his very different response to Martin Delaney, who's arguing that black people ought to get up uh, uh, and uh, and and go. And uh, Martin Delaney um, uh, in the 1850s to William Lord Garrison was very clear that look, if there if there was any probability, and this is Delaney's language. Um, that uh, black people would be treating would be treated fairly. If there was any probability, he would stay. Where in the 1850s, he would stay and fight the good fight. But then he says, "I have I have no hope. Uh, I have uh, uh, no uh, faith uh, in in my fellows." Uh, um, Douglas would respond subsequently to this account, and uh, Douglas would 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 say, "Look, I don't disagree with." Uh, Brother Delaney and his interest in uh, um, uh, in black people going elsewhere. I disagree that he doesn't have sufficient faith to believe that black people will be will be treated uh, fairly on on American soil. But this idea of faith it not only motivates Douglas, but it's fueling uh, Anna Julia Cooper uh, in the 1890s as she's mm -hmm. trying to make sense of how do we understand. Uh, slaves who are escaping from 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 freedom, excuse me, escaping from slavery, but who sort of see in the North, the United States North, uh, a possibility for their for their freedom. And then, of course, as we come downstream, um, this idea of of, of faith uh, also houses itself or is located within 
the sort of religious traditions of African Americans, obviously um, the sort of the sort of Christian imaginary of African Americans that is helping to sort of mobilize um, not just simply the activism uh, in the 20s and 30s, but most certainly um, in um, the 40s, 50s, and of course the famous uh, the famous uh, civil rights movement. But what I think binds them all uh, together, even the religious. Uh, even the religious descriptions of faith is 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 this sense um, that these folks are sort of running ahead of the evidence that they need to justify this stance that they're taking. And they know that for those who rely on strong evidentiary foundations, they're going to appear to those folks as simply irrational. And yet they want to say it is not at all clear how we account for radical political struggle in the absence of, 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 of faith to begin with. Neil, do you wanna add anything yeah. to um, the question or to Melvin's response? Um, I mean, on this one, I might um, say Melvin said it kind of best because I think this one probably was most squarely um, rooted in um to, to melvin's book however i would add <laughs> that um uh, i do think we should say a, a bit more about um ida b wells um uh because um because I, I i have to say in terms of when i melvin when i initially saw the kind of architecture of the book not a book that if it was merely a, uh, a work that's engaging kind of African-American political thought, but especially this kind of idea of faith, I was trying to figure out where Ida B. Wells fit into, uh, into your account. And, and, and one of the things for those um, who have not read the, the text and that you soon will is that, um, you know, uh, the book does engage very much, not only kind of lynching, but more broadly with Ida B. Wells, we know that one of the areas that Wells was um, deeply committed was kind of journalism. Right. Um, and uh, and even though that's not the focus of your book, uh, that the um, that Wells's commitments and even pushing a figure of Frederick Douglass, as we know, before uh, Douglass passed away, uh, that one of the Ida B. Wells's biggest critiques of Frederick Douglass in the postbellum period, particularly with the kind of the, the period that not just the rise, but the fall of Reconstruction was saying, Douglas, why are you not uh, using your social and political capital to address lynching? How lynching has been an attempt, particularly with uh, the kind of pushback to Reconstruction as a way to kind of refracture the demos. And that uh, I've always found it in 2023 that Ida B. Wells had a newspaper that was called Free Speech. It's, it's as if free speech that Ida B., has Ida B. Wells understood it was the antithesis of how we talk about free speech uh, today. And so a question of faith, perhaps with Ida B. Wells' faith for Wells, uh, that there's something about the, the, a sense of kind of truth, kind of truth telling, trying to actually use that as a way, not in a, re a, a religious sense, but perhaps um, uh, as one mechanism to, uh, to really address uh, what some of these other figures and movements were trying to do, but in 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 her own way. So for the you know for those for those tuning in, part of what Neil is picking up on um, is the way in which we look at um, Ida B. Wells, a sort of famous uh, black journalist, um, to sort of pull back the um, uh, um, to sort of pull back um, the curtain so that all can bear witness the horror of lynch and what is really motivating it. And the thought, uh, as I'm following uh, uh, Neil, is that her emphasis on journalism, um, to put it in different terms, um, was largely epistemic, that she thought in the revelation of the truth, the facts about lynching, that it was the facts that could sort of move, um, move her reader. And in that regard, she seemed not to have, one might say, it, 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 sort of any interest in uh, reaching uh, for faith. The only thing I would say is that th this is actually sort of how we sort of typically read. Um, this is how mm -hmm. we typically read, rather, um, uh, Wells. And one of the things that it obscures is how heavily she leans on the aesthetic, on the idea of horror, on the idea of brutality. And, and the question that becomes, why is she leaning on these terms as a way 
to move her audience. And that, it seems to me, has less to do with the sort of the sort of sort of um, the sort of epistemic resources of our audience or the openness of those epistemic resources. It has something to do with a certain description of human nature that she has in view and in which my, my claim would be and in which she places her faith. Even as she is insisting, even as she is telling us, it is not at all clear um, how it is or why it is one's white counterparts would act differently, given that she helps us to see that the problem of lynching not only speaks to the issues around patriarchy and gender in various ways, but Ida B. Wells is also clear that the practice of lynching um, helps to sort of fortify the identity of her white counterparts. And you have to, when you read Ida B. Wells, you have to say at the end of that, well, if that's the case, why are you not speaking like Henry McNeil Turner of the 1890s, who basically says, look, I'm gonna follow Delaney and I'm gonna follow, um, you know, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna follow Delaney um, and uh, I'm gonna suggest that African-Americans ought to pick up and go, but that's not the move she makes. And the question is, why doesn't she make the move? And my argument is, is that the reason why she doesn't make that move has less to do with this story about journalism and truth a, a, a telling, and it has more to do with this background faith that she places in human nature, that it can be moved by uh, the horrific, even though that same nature seems to be thriving um, uh, on the horrific. So that's, I mean, so that, I mean, that's my, you know, that's my thought. I think that's the one area of the text where a great many people are going to say, Paul Taylor has already said something about this seems to be mm -hmm. out of step with the a claim about with the claim about uh, the claim about faith, and I, I have to, I have, I have um, his comments, and I have to respond to those to, to those comments. Okay, that's great. We're pretty much at time, maybe a little bit over. There's just one more question, which I guess we'll have to ask um, Melvin and then Neil to do a sort of a a, a quick fire answer. To <laughs> it. It's just a question that I, th I think is very interesting. It's also one of the earliest ones asked. It's from Har Harry Ramesh, who, who basically, to sum up the question, says, how do the thinkers Melvin writes about link education and republicanism, and might these linkages help guide our thinking today? So any brief thoughts on that, Melvin? Right. So, um, uh, so, so very briefly, um, for all of these thinkers, I mean, we live in a very different time um, where the sort of intellectual landscape, the landscape of publishing is so saturated. Uh, these are very different times. And so the writing of a, of a pamphlet and the writing of a book like The Souls of Black Folk of 1903 could go very, very far um, in attempting to sort of, uh, sort of generate public debate in an attempt uh, in stimulating in people uh, a thoughtful reflection. I mean, so um, uh, so incendiary was David Walker's pamphlet that on the one side uh, by African-Americans, it was sort of described in, in, in various uh, newspapers um, as, as, as a light that had awakened them. Uh, to, to, to grab the sort of drama of it. Um, and on the other side, it had mobilized uh, politicians in the South um, to pass laws banning African-Americans from being able to read um, uh, being, uh, or having permission to read or being allowed to read or being read to, to, uh, uh, to them. And, and so uh, very different landscape. And, uh, but what I would suggest is that these figures thought that their activity of writing and circulating was part of the, the sort of broad system of re-educating the public. Um, this is what Ida B. Wells thinks in her journalism. Um, there are others who think um, that art could serve this form, right? Billy Holiday's sort of performance, we didn't get a chance to talk about Billy Holiday, but Billy Holiday's performance of Strange Fruit, right? But all of it was that through, uh, through one sort of uh, uh, ability to sort of uh, see and to listen um, to these productions, that this could be part of the sort of educational uh, 
a trans a transformation. The final point I would make here, I know we're trying to move quickly, but the final point I would make here is is something that I think is quite important. These things <clears throat> believe that they belong to a time um, in which their fellows actually could be horrified by the image or that they could be moved by the song. I don't know that we uh, uh, that we sort of subscribe. I don't know that we subscribe to that view. Um, that view today. I'm unsure about it. If I can, I know we're at our uh, end, but if I could just, if I may, to add on to what Melvin said, I think education is is essential to this, not just tradition, this story, and then even today. Um, but it's not insignificant to to the question of Hari Ramesh posed that. Um, that Anna Julia Cooper, first and foremost, was a principal, was an educator, right? Many of the works that we know Cooper today, uh, uh, her work on race in the, in the French Revolution was after, years after um, uh, she was a principal. Du Bois is a subject of Melvin's book, particularly um, two works, The Souls of Black Book, but also a piece in the 1920s, Criteria of Negro Art. But uh, I, I know we can't get to the question, but I, I believe I saw in the chat that there was a question about Du Bois's idea of abolition, democracy, and Black Reconstruction in America. But Du Bois has a whole chapter. I teach this, and I don't know why more people don't discuss it. Du Bois has a whole chapter about Black schools, right? The, the idea of kind of a Black in that narrative of, in that tome um, in which he asserts abolition, democracy, he's imagining education, literally the building of schools. Uh, at a moment in which, um, uh, you know, at a moment in which there has been this kind of repression um, after the Civil War, that education has a significance and not just philosophical tomes, but literally, what does it mean to literally build a school, create a school, the nature of Black education, and how does that, uh, how does that connect? And it is not insignificant, last point, I promise, Anthony, <laughs> it's not insignificant that the notion of abolition democracy then gets refashioned and repurposed in, in a figure like Angela Davis, who as uh, someone who is known as, uh, Melvin, you open with this, that different figures who are known as kind of activists or, or, or known for or what they've experienced, but Davis as a, as a professor, right? As a philosophy professor. Uh, and that has used this notion of abolition democracy to not only talk about questions of mass, mass incarceration, uh, gendered violence, but also uh, freedom, right? The nature in which as Bell Hooks talked about like Davis, um, the nature that freedom and abolitionism also kind of pertains to the refashioning of orders of education in one period uh, and then creating something anew or Eddie Glaude, right, to begin anew. That's the last I have to so, say. So the first point then is that we shouldn't we shouldn't be banning these books then. That's the yeah. first place to begin, right? Um, but, but, but because this is precisely, like, this is precisely what Du Bois thought, that that is to say that you put these texts in wide circulation as a means to engage in that sort of slow um, reacculturation, redevelopment uh, of of character of, of of the soul in Du Bois's case. All right, mm -hmm. and that's because Neil, you and I, yeah. can, you and I can keep going yeah. on about it. 